All right. Welcome to the Knicks Film School postgame show presented by BetUS. Uh, the Knicks lose uh, their fourth game of the road trip in Dallas, 129 to 114, a score that um, is deceiving in pro- probably a couple ways if you didn't watch the game. Uh, the Knicks wind up scoring, uh, let me see if I could do some quick math, 70. 70- Six points? Is that right? In the second half of this game? Yeah, because they scored 38 in the first half. Um, and yet uh, uh, many of those, especially the ones that kind of came in the last four or five minutes of the fourth quarter, uh, were pretty hollow. Um, I am going to warn everybody up front. This is not a game I'm getting freaked out over. I am uh, I'm not going to sit here and be like, I am unbothered. I don't know that any fan could be unbothered after... A loss, uh, especially when the team that uh, you are facing off against was missing three rotation players, including uh, maybe, you know, the second or third best player in the NBA. Although, oddly enough, I will say this, that Luka Doncic not playing tonight. Well, obviously, um, you could we could talk about the impact that it had on Dallas's offense, although it didn't sure, sure shit didn't look like it had much impact on Dallas's offense tonight. Um, it helps them on the defensive end. Uh, and I think you saw that, especially in the first half. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's an annoying loss. It was uh, a nice opportunity, you thought, going in to get the first three games of the four of the five game road trip. And then you head into uh, Charlotte on Friday with a chance to really clean up and go four and one on the trip. Now that goes off the table. Look, a three and two trip is still good. Anytime you go three and two on a road trip where you the first four are out west, um, it, it, it's a good road trip, but we'll, we'll worry about Charlotte once we get to Charlotte. Um, let's talk about this game uh, first. So the story of the game, I think there are a couple stories of the game. Let's start with the Knicks. Um, it's been a while since we've seen a switching defense like this. And, and one of my questions that I have, and obviously I won't know the answer to this, uh, is would the Mavs have switched as much if Luka was in? Uh, without Luca, it was an easy decision because you have Derek Lively, who's one of the best switching bigs in the NBA. And boy, oh boy, I, I don't know if that guy's ever going to be able to put up the numbers or reach like, you know, I don't know what level would he have to reach defensively with the numbers that he's probably going to get over most of his career to like make an all-star team or make a couple all-star teams. Guy's incredible, uh, an absolutely incredible player. And just what he's able to do and the flexibility he's able to give you defensively with his ability to both switch and protect the rim. I'm, I'm actually kind of wondering how many, how many bigs in the league are as good at both protecting the rim and switching out on defenders. Like, you know, you got bam, you got AD. It's probably in that conversation, right? Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, pro- I'm sure I'm forgetting someone obvious, but he's right there. Um, and between him and obviously Najee Marshall, who I know I, thought a lot about before the season started once uh you know with the clay thompson trade well were they actually better off starting maybe best off starting starting Najee marshall or were they better off starting clay or um excuse me quentin grimes because clay thompson another guy like did it did it hurt their offense tonight that clay wasn't there it didn't seem like it did did it help their defense yeah i would say so tonight you got to start both Najee and quentin grimes Najee's an excellent defender with some size and Grimes, we know what he could do on defense. I thought it was good tonight. And then PJ Washington, PJ Washington goes from being, you know, when, when Gafford's in there and, and I know Gafford like still kind of starts occasionally or did at least the beginning of the year, you know, PJ Washington goes from being their best defender to their fourth best defender. And then you just got Kyrie who always, you know, he always gets up to play the Knicks. Um, so that defense in the first half was able to switch everything against the Knicks. And they were, it's like, Maybe because it had been a while since they'd played to switch everything to defense, but like they didn't know what to do. And there were possessions where opportunities were there to get Towns the ball against a small, um, you know, opportunities for uh, Brunson to maybe force the issue again a, a little bit against the big. And this is again why I will slot their offensive struggles in this game and why I'm really unbothered in long term on adjustment period getting used to stuff we've seen brunson now over the last whatever it's been two three weeks turn into one of the best distributors and facilitators in the game well this game called for him to be something different than that this game called for him to like hey 
if you're going to switch whoever onto me, yeah, it might be a tough matchup for me, but that might still be our best offense. And it took him, he was excellent all game, to be clear, but you could argue he should have even gone after it more in the first half, or at the very least made sure that Towns was getting opportunities to go after the switches onto Towns, because that's really, in theory, the biggest mismatch. And yet we see sometimes that when teams slot smalls on Towns in certain situations, he could go to town. Like we saw a couple of possessions in the first half where Dallas had a guy who I frankly had never heard of before on him and towns put him in the hoop. But on the other hand, when towns has someone out there on an Island against him and he wants to take that guy off the dribble, doesn't always go as well. You know, when he, when he, so I thought maybe there should have been, they should have been a little bit more methodical. If you want to say trying to get towns um, engaged on some of those switches, and I also think the fact that, and then you, then you, so you take all that and you throw in the fact that for the second time in three games, they could not buy a three. They ended up shooting. I mean, I don't even know what they ended up shooting in the game from three. They ended up shooting 24% from three and that improved. They were two of 16 in the first half. So you combine all that switching stuff with, you can't hit shots from deep and you're not getting any calls. And I thought the, the I know the Knicks got to the line. Um, a bunch of time, 30 times at the end of the game. Mavs only got there 21. I thought this was a bad whistle tonight. And you know me, I don't complain about the whistle. I thought this was a bad whistle tonight. And and I thought they felt like they weren't getting the call. So when you put all that together, what do you get? You get 38 points in the first half. And you are facing a team that even without Luka Doncic, and now we're going to get to the other story of the game, which is the Mavs couldn't miss. You know, this was one of those nights for Dallas. Um Am I going to sit here and say that the defense was perfect? Of course not. Anybody could go out right now and go, we watched the tape of that game and you could find seven or eight possessions easily where the Knicks defense like did something wrong. And it, it resulted in a, a good opportunity, a good shot attempt for, for Dallas. I am just not grading the Knicks on a scale where I am expecting or even like wanting perfection. Those possessions where the Knicks mess up and it, an open shot happens, it's going to happen every game. It's going to happen every game now in November, and they're going to probably happen every game in March and April and May and June. That's as much a function of anything the Knicks are doing or not doing as the fact that this is the NBA and like it's offenses are sophisticated. What I was impressed by tonight by the Knicks is I thought they had a lot of really positive defensive possessions. And I we've been talking a lot about how can the Knicks bring more aggression on the defensive end of the court. I thought you saw that tonight. I thought they really tried to take it to the Mavs on a lot of possessions. Sometimes it worked out in their favor. Sometimes it didn't work out in their favor. Um, and then at the end of the day, it didn't matter. Why? Because for as much as you could point to a handful or two of defensive possessions where the Knicks look very poor, you could point to another couple of handfuls of defensive possessions where the Knicks did everything right and the Mavs scored anyway. And it was just one of those nights for the Mavs who ended up shooting 51% from downtown, made 17 to 33 and 56% overall. Uh, Spencer did what he, I don't know what happens to that guy when he sees the Knicks. It, I know he's had bad games against him. So I can't remember any of them. All I remember are the good games. I mean, he scored 21 points on 11 shots tonight. And I frankly don't remember the three shots he missed. So you had incredible shot making from Dallas all night long, almost regardless of what the Knicks were or were not doing on defense. And you had the Knicks taking a half to figure out the offense a little bit. And then that's your game. You know, that's your game. It's as simple as that. Uh are there, you know, are there things that we could point to that are, are are maybe more troubling than not? Yeah, sure. Like, again, to speak of the defense, um, I, I mean, it's the two guys we've been talking about all year. Macau Bridges, Carl Anthony Towns. If you want to point to some defensive possessions tonight where you're like, well, on Towns' end, like, Explain to me how that guy is going to be able to stay on the floor at the five against a really good offense. And tonight, even though the Mavs didn't have Luka Doncic, like the way they were hitting shots, was, they, you know, Spencer did what he was playing the role of Luka Doncic tonight. So, like, that was a really good offense. And and honestly, they're such a well-oiled machine. I mean, they made the freaking finals last year. Um, so, like, yeah, they they have some some street cred, as it were. So, like, if you want to tell me there were possessions there that are going to make you worried about Towns 
and, and his ability to stay on the floor against a defense or against an offense that has a lot of a movement, a lot of ball movement, a lot of player movement, um, really makes him do some stuff. And like we saw him in, in space sometimes, didn't go great. We saw him in drop, that didn't look great. You know, I thought that was interesting that they went back to drop tonight after not going with it for a while. So clearly still trying to figure out their way, all that stuff. So that wasn't great. And then, you know, Bridges, you know, that possession at the end, I think it was at the end of the first half where it's like, and he, it, it looked like, I don't even know what it was. It looked like he gets wrong, you know, and Kyrie just kind of blows by, blows by him. Um, Still waiting for the McCall Bridges. I, and I know he's been better defensively of late. Not even saying he was terrible in this game. He wasn't. But you're still waiting for that guy who's going to show up and be the level of of impact defender that you thought you traded for. And, um, you know, to say nothing of the fact that, like, I know he went 4 of 10 from 3 tonight. It's a good, it's a good sign. He, some of those makes. Uh, there was a moment, I think it was in the third quarter, where he had a fantastic look from the corner. And it was one of those momentum shots where I forget what the score was, but it was like they were on a little run and he had a chance. And it just, you know, and, and he was not the only one. I mean, let's just read some stats. OG Ananobi, three for 15 from the field. Um, It's funny. I was going to read some other stats, but everybody else scored at will in the fourth quarter. So nobody else's shooting numbers were that bad. I mean, Towns was seven to 16, but he scored 25 points on 16 shots. So it's tough to complain. Um. Yeah, I mean, Hart got it going late. Um, bench didn't really do much tonight, but then again, they didn't play that much. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure people are going to scream about the fact that the starters win until the final buzzer. You want to yell about that? That's fine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, Bridges twenty points on nineteen shots. That's when you when you when you haven't been to the free throw line in a month. It's tough to be super efficient. You know, even if you are hitting forty percent from three, which he did tonight, but uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to rag on Bridges or or anybody. Even like, I, you know, OG had a bad night. Whatever, that dude's been the most consistent Nick for seventeen games. I'm not about to crap on OG and Obi. He had a bad night. It happens. So yeah, um, for me, just one of those nights. Again, not to excuse it, not to say it doesn't matter, not to say that. You know, all the things that we've been talking about that are issues for this team didn't rear their head in this game. It's all true. But like, whereas I was even with Utah shooting what they shot from three on Saturday, whereas I was really not very happy on Saturday. Um, tonight, I'm like, you know, tip your cap. And like, I think this is the first loss where I could be like, all right, I'm not, you know, every every loss up until now had something about it that really annoyed you. And I don't, I don't know that anything for me tonight, and again, I'm I'm not always the best judge of these things. I, there are times where I'm not seeing something that other people are seeing or I'm not you know, responding to something in the way that other people are responding to it. Um, so I may, I may be missing something here, but this is not something that I'm – this is not a loss where I'm, I'm going crazy about. Um, I think that's – I really think that's it. You know, I, I wish I had more to say about this one, but I just uh, I don't. I'm sure some stuff will come up uh, as we go through the Super Chats. Uh, let me do the autograph signature moment of the game. Uh, if you would like to uh, get rewarded for all the things you're already doing, being a fan of the Knicks or any other team that you are a fan of, uh, go to autograph. Uh, download the app. You could enter code KFS when you do. Uh, you get to see all of uh, the content that you would usually be consuming, except you get credit for it. And you get to see exclusive stuff from people like me. Um, and I will actually be hosting a, uh, I think, a pregame. And I'm pretty sure I'm doing a halftime, both uh, chat uh, for the Hornets game uh, on Friday. So if you're going to want to, if you guys are maybe out doing some Black Friday shopping or, you know, and you want to, pop in and, and talk to me for a bit. Uh, I will be again on the autograph app before the game. Uh, and, and I think also during uh, halftime. So go download that and get code KFS um, a signature moment of this game, man, that's, uh, that's not easy. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the, the McCall bridges above the break three to make it 28 to 18. <laughs> 
that's that's so sad that that's the signature moment of the game. But it is because hey, you try to take positives, right? Uh, especially when a guy is struggling, and when you are uh, really concerned about a player. And I think there has been a lot of concern about Macau Bridges early on. When you see some little little positives, little little slivers of hope, you latch on to them, and you appreciate them for what they are, even if it didn't lead to a win on any given night. So. Macau Bridges hitting it above the break three. How about that for my autograph signature moment of the game? Okay.